And uh, this expression comes from the mouth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It appears first on his lips during his trial. In the early stage of his suffering, he just has been arrested and uh, he's been carried to the Sanhedrin and uh, they are quickly setting up a meeting that is an unfair meeting, illegal meeting, and their difficulty is to come up with the false accusations that would lead to a death sentence. And this is the context of that this morning. So as they were seeking for uh, witnesses to falsely accuse him, they had to go back to the early stage of his ministry when Jesus said in John chapter 2, uh, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So false witness came and used this expression to, to come and accuse uh, Jesus. But Jesus didn't even say a word. He had nothing to say against these false accusers at that point. But then he was questioned uh, about the unique relationship to God. And he opened his mouth only when that question came. And uh, we, we see the, his answer. Jesus was silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath. By the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And then you have this answer of Jesus right here. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and declared, he has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? Now you have heard the blasphemy. What's your verdict? They answered, he is guilty and deserved that. So that's the only at the moment where Jesus answer and says, you have said it yourself. And this is very important for us because this expression will flow throughout the New Testament. And this expression has brought uh, comfort and encouragement to generation to generation of Christians. And it will bring to you this morning. Hallelujah. The court instantly recognized the reference to Daniel chapter 7 and then to Psalms 110 this morning. We were, were uh, um, prophetic announcements declaring about the Messiah when he would come. And Jesus has used that so they recognized the reference. And Jesus, I want you to know, to realize something. When Jesus spoke these words, he knew these words will accuse him. This will be his downfall. This will be the time where they will get on his case. And it will be the, the, the time of the beginning of his agony, of his, uh, of his persecutions, of the torture, of the beatings, of the cross, of, of, of everything. He knew it. And yet, he did not panic. He was calm. He was courageous. And he remained determined. And I want you to have a, a time to, to reflect upon that this morning. He knew from these words, when he spoke these words, this is the end. This is the moment. This is the turning point. And uh, what he happened. But he still spoke. And his reply, he claimed to be equal with God. To be the son of God was to be God. So Jesus says to the high priest, you have said it yourself. In other words, what you ask me, because that came under the form of a question, what you ask of me is the fact. It's true. And you, you know it very well. So when he said, you said it yourself, or you have said so, it's an indirect way to say yes, and at the same time to point to what the other person already know in their heart. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and you says, ah, you already know it. I don't need to answer you. You already know it. So that's the kind of uh, answer that Jesus says. You said it yourself. You already know about it. And then you, you're still speaking that. And then Jesus says, but. And the word but here is uh, besides that, or nevertheless, or apart from my affirmation, you will see for yourself. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. And you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of 
heaven. I want you to observe th some of these uh, uh, expression. Let's go to Daniel and Psalm 110 because this is important. This was spoken hundreds of years before Jesus used it for himself. And you have the, the text. Ob observe the expression here. I was watching in the night visions and with the clouds of the sky was like one son of man was approaching. He went up to the ancient of days and he was escorted before him. To him was given. I want you to look at that. To him was given ruling, authority, honor, and sovereignty. That is what has been prophesied about the Messiah at that point. All peoples, nations, and language groups from generation to generation were serving him. His authority is eternal and will not pass away. His kingdom will not be destroyed. So we see his so a declaration of his sovereignty and you see a declaration that his reign will be eternal. That, that's the point that I want you to, to observe. And in Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I will make your enemies your footstool. So that is the, uh, the expression that Jesus was referred to when he declared, you've said it yourself. From now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So what is Jesus telling here? The truth is, I am much more than the Messiah that you think you know of. Because they are the concept at the time of what uh, how the Messiah would appear, how he would be. So he says, I'm much more than that concept that you have of the Messiah. It may appear from now that I have no kingdom because the, the prophecy said that Daniel said there will be given ruling authority, honor, and sovereignty, and his kingdom will be eternal. But at the time when Jesus appeared before the Sanhedrin, did he look like he had this kind of power? Did he look like he had this kind of authority and, you know, like he was in control over the angels, that he was so much in glory, that he was the eternal king? He doesn't look like it. He was, he was the accused. He was the accused. He already had been blindfolded. He's already been slapped in the face. He's already been accused, laughed at, and all this. It's, this has already started at the time of that conversation. When you look and look, or when you look at the same text and mark, you will see. I was looking at trying to find some uh, uh, Bible videos when I was preparing this week about the different uh, contexts. So he's already been mocked and everything. So it may appear from now that I have no kingdom, no glory, no dominion while I suffer. But I truly say to you, you will see. And that's a word for us in this room this morning. You also, we will see something about the rule and the authority and the sovereignty. And on that day, you will be very happy to be on his side. You will be very happy that you have held on to your confession of faith, that you have endured regardless of when you went through your crisis and your difficulties, that you have persevered in the faith, that you have continued on to follow the Son of Man, to follow Jesus your Savior, to remain faithful. You will be very happy. You will see. You will see that by yourself. So be encouraged by that word of Jesus this morning. You might not see this morning that Jesus rules. You don't see the rule of Christ in this world at the moment yet. Do you see it? I, I don't see it. I don't see it. But you will see. And that, that's, that, I want you to stop on these words. You will see. That is coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ when he stood on trial. And let's see if these words are true. Number two, Jesus tell the high priest, I'm on trial here. And I'm on the days of my suffering. I uh, was forced to stand. I'm the accused here. But the Son of Man will be seated. He will not be the defendant anymore. He will not be the accused. On that day, he will be the judge. 
So that, that, that there's a turning point in that declaration of Jesus Christ. There's a prophetic encouragement for all of us this morning. You saw the suffering of Jesus Christ, but Jesus is announcing this will change and you will see the honor, the authority, the sovereignty. And we need to know that this morning in our heart. And Matthew 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man comes and his glory, and all, is, all the angels with him, how is he coming? And his glory. Is there any people coming with him? The angels. Then he will sit upon his, what kind of throne does he have? Glorious, Glorious thrones. And all the nations will be gathered in his presence. That is coming. That's, that's ahead. But at the time when Jesus spoke these words, we couldn't see that yet. And that's the same thing for us. We are in the time of sin. We are in the time where we are waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. So that's why we need to hold on to our faith. You, you know that story where Jesus says the king uh, gave his order, his task to his servant, then he went away on a faraway land, and then he will come back. And the servants who have been found being faithful, who manage well, that have been good stewards, will be rewarded for that. Jesus is coming again. Number three. You say, the high priest says, you are a blasphemer. You blaspheme me, you blaspheme, and he tore up his, his clothes and everything. You say, and you think that I am a blasphemer, that God is angry with me, that I stand under God's judgment. But the day is coming when I will not only sit in the presence of God, but I will sit in the place of honor with God. He will be, he is exalted. And your blindness, the, 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 the high priest was blind. He couldn't figure it out. You sentenced me to death. You want to destroy me. You want to get rid of me. But I will not only rise from the dead, but I will reign in heaven at the right hand of God. And I will come again in the clouds with power and a great glory. And you will see this. You will see this. And this is a claim that Jesus shares the authority with God and heaven. Do you realize that? Do we realize that this morning? That Jesus, after his, his voluntary humiliation, has been exalted to the highest positions. And we, his followers, are going to see him. We are going to be with him. We are going to worship him. We are going to rejoice on that day when he comes in his glory and might and everything. Amen? Hallelujah. You will see that, Jesus says. Romans 8.34 you know, I, w I, I didn't realize it, but that expression, seated at the right hand of God, is spread throughout the New Testament uh, dozens of times. So, so I'm just picking up a few of them. Who is the one who will condemn? Christ is the one who died. And more than that, he was raised. Who is at the right hand of God and who is also interceding for us? Have you ever thought of yourself like not good enough for God. Like you, 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 you messed up again, and uh, you know, you're weak, and you, 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 you thought you made a decision to change, and you, you committed yourself, and then you fail again or something. These verses are for you. If God gave his son for you, is he going to uh, hold, hold back anything that you need? to live for him. Th think, think about the, the logic. There's an argument. Who is the one who condemned? Christ is the one. If God has done anything for you, as much as giving his son for you, is he going to hold back? Is he going to refuse you? Something that you need to make you overcomers and to show his love to you? He already showed you his love. I want you to realize something. You know, many times we look at the book of Romans like it's a book of doctrines and a book of theology. But the book of, doc of, of Roman is much more than that. It's actually a letter of comfort, a letter of encouragement, because these doctrines mean something important to us. It is being applied to our life. It, it brings up the best uh, that God has for us. You know, 
this verse in Romans chapter 8, this old chapter actually of Romans 8 is so wonderful for us. Who will condemn Christ not only died, much more important than he died for us, he rose and it is the attestation that, Christ, that God accepted the sacrifice for our sin. So now he has been exalted and the expression here that we need to stop and think about, he is interceding for us. He is in heaven, he is interceding for us. We have been acquitted you, this morning, if you believe in Christ, you are not guilty anymore. You are not guilty. So if someone accuses you this morning, it's not God. It, it is Satan who accuses you. Jesus is your advocate. He's on your side. He's interceding for you. And he sits at the presence and the presence of God. And he presents your case. He's defending you. He's the go-between man. I want you to look at some more scriptures that talk about that. Uh, Hebrew chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, and observe some of the expression this morning, we are talking about the expression seated at the right hand of God. And you see something equivalent to that. He passed through the heaven. He, he's already been there. He's already been ahead of us. He's sitting at the right hand of God because he passed through the heaven. Jesus, the Son of God. So you and I, this morning, let us hold on to Jesus. Hold on to Jesus because you will see him. For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. He understands our human weaknesses, our human nature. He understands and yet without sin. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace whenever we need help. Look at the expression. The priesthood of Jesus Christ is, we know, superior to the one of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the, the high priest was the highest religious authority, the most important person to connect with God. There was no others. And he alone, once a year, could enter into the Holy of Holy and to offer sacrifice and spread the blood to uh, serve as atonement for the sin of the people. Once a year, every year. So I want you to realize in this text some of the expressions, like uh, we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. He is there already. And like the high priest, Jesus does his ministry between God and us, and he can sympathize with us. He intercedes for us before God. Because Jesus represents us, we can approach the throne of God. And it, again, another expression, when we look at the expression seated at the right hand of God, what kind of seat does Jesus have? Is that a throne of judgment? That's a throne of grace. What comes out of this throne of grace? Is that more accusation? No, it is mercy. It is mercy. So le le let's think about these things this morning as a people of God. We all have a, hu a human nature, a sinful nature, and we all have our quirks and our mistakes, and we all mess up repeatedly in our lifetime. But we have a lawyer, an advocate, a stand between, a representative, someone who understands us, someone who is sitting in the highest place of authority for you and for me. And he is there not with judgment, he is there with grace and help. Grace, mercy, and help. That is the seed that he is sitting on. That is the glorious throne where Jesus is uh, this morning. We can see that. So the next scripture is this morning. We see that Jesus Christ is able to save completely those who come to God through him. So what do you need to do? 
come to God through him. There is no other way. No one can come to the Father but by me. Come through him. And there's a reason why. Because he's already there. He passed through the heaven. He's already sitting there. He already has the authority. And another thing that you see in this verse, he always lives. And I want to insist on the word always this morning because that's very important. The high priest, earthly high priest, was once a year, every year, that he could uh, uh, offer uh, sacrifices for atonement. With Jesus, he's always. He is interceding. He is continually, Christ is always at the right hand. He is always interceding for us. He is always available to hear us when we pray. I want us to realize that so that's why he can save us completely or to the uttermost. You cannot be more saved. You cannot add anything to what Jesus has done. Look at the, the apostle uh, Peter when we think about the intercession of Jesus. Satan has asked to sift you but I have prayed for you. And Jesus is always there interceding. It's a ministry that gives us security. We, we, we don't have to be insecure because Jesus is offering security for us. He's interceding for us. Look at uh, Hebrew uh, 8, 1 and 2. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. And a, such a high priest, a, a unique high priest, a, a highly exalted high priest. His qualification is unique. One who sat down at the right hand. Again, another expression. Every time you look at one of these expressions and the spread in the New Testament, seated at the right hand, you'll always pick up something more. Each one has a context, and each one gives us something to to, to, to look up to. Here he is sitting on the right hand of the throne of the majesty and heaven. Again, uh, an expression of authority, of exaltation, of honor, of dignity. He is above everything. A minister in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle that the Lord, not man, set up. Here you find something more. Jesus has not completely finished. He has offered his sacrifice for our sin, but he is still involved with you and me. And we still need him. We still can go to him. Why, why are we called to pray? Why are we called to look up to him? Why are we called not to worry about anything, but seek the kingdom of God first? Why are we called to present our petitions before the throne of God so that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus? Because Jesus Christ is a minister in the sanctuary. The word minister here is, is liturgus. You have two words in the New Testament for uh, a minister or servant, someone who serves God. Diakonos, like a servant at the table. Uh, Jesus is a diakonos and, and his ministry for us on, on the earth. Uh, the, the deacons are serving. Uh, ministers of the gospel are diakonos also. We are all diakonos. All of us, we are diakonos. But there's another word that has to do with uh, the, the liturgy, the, the serving in the ministry uh, as a special uh, ministry toward God, and that's the word that is used over here. So, you know, the Jews in the Old Testament, and uh, well, the Jews, when the Christian would discover Jesus and turn to Jesus, the Jews persecuted them. The Apostle Paul was a great persecutor of the church. Because it says, you are abandoning the, the priesthood, the temple. What do you have? Yeah, and it was an accusation of the Romans. It was an accusation of the Jews. Like the Christians had not a place of worship. They were not worshiping a statue. They were not uh, worshipers of something made of, of of um, man-made or something because the Jewish they had the temple they you know they had the ceremonies they had all the washings they had all of the rituals they had the priests of the Old Testament they had the Levites we have that what do you have 
And here we learn that they had much more than they had. They had the true servant. They had the true temple. They had the access to Jesus Christ himself in the true tabernacle that the Lord has made, not man has made. So we have, Christian this morning, the person of Jesus, the, the great minister that, uh, that is there for us. He looks after our interests. He intercedes for us with God. He is a high priest. He is an advocate. He is a mediator between God and us. No other priest before Jesus Christ ever sat down at the recognition that he has finished his work. And none ever held such a place of honor. Jesus is exalted above everything. Christ is always making intercessions. He's continually in the presence of God for us. So do you feel guilty this morning? Do you feel that fear of failure? You, I realized uh, it was come very strongly in my, in my heart this morning when I was preparing and reading my not, notes. Some of you this morning in this room don't trust yourself. You've already failed. You've already <laughs> disappointed yourself. And you are disappointed with yourself. And you feel very weak. And you stand here week after week. You sing the songs. And then you, you feel about yourself. You look at yourself. And you doubt if you will ever be able to make it right. Or to be pleasing to God. And I want you to stop just a moment here with this text and says, yes, I'm important in the eyes of God. God is there for me. Jesus already declared me not guilty, and he is interceding, and that's all I need to know. It's not about me and my mistakes. The mercy of God is there. I want you to receive it this morning. Receive it. Hebrew chapter 1, verse 3. He, this is the text where it says that Jesus Christ, the Son, is the radiance of His glory, the exact likeness of His being, that He sustains all things by His powerful word. And when He had accomplished cleansing for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He finished what He had to do. The Lord is the exact representation. We know exactly what he has done for us. He sat down. And this post posture is a posture of rest. Not because he was tired. You know, sometimes you're very, very tired and you need to, to rest. But that's not the case here. This the sitting down of Jesus Christ at the right hand is the satisfactions of a finished work. He has done it. He has completed his task as son of man, as representative for our sins. And then he can sit and he has been exalted in the position of honor, privilege, glorious triumph, and positions of power. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. There's another uh, scripture is here that is very encouraging. Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings too closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That is you and me. That's what we are doing right now. We have a race. We have the challenge. We have to make it to the end. We are in this competition competing uh, stadium and we have to finish the race set before us how do we do that looking unto Jesus when you're looking to Jesus where do you look where is Jesus what is he doing is it to the left is it to the right where is Jesus when you look at that you see that he is sitting on the right hand because he finished everything and it, we have a declaration here that when we look to Jesus, we receive encouragement because Jesus is the supreme, ultimate example of faith. Look at what he has done. The list is there. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. He's, and he, he went through all of this suffering for you and for me. He went there. And he was looking at the end, the result of that, and he could find joy and the, and the suffering of that because he knew what it was going to do for you and for me this morning. He accomplished his mission. He endured everything for you and me. 
And this morning he is che cheering you up. He's telling you, let us run. Let's go. Let's do it together this morning. Let's persevere because Jesus has done it first. He is the supreme example of our, of our faith. And he is the perfecter. He is the one who can help us to strengthen our faith. He is there with us. He's continuing with us. He's showing us this example that he has triumphed and he made it first. And because of that, we can take comfort this morning. Hallelujah. Another important text, I think, this morning is this one here, because it emphasizes something that is important for all of us. This power, the great power, incomparable greatness of his power toward us who believe, and verse 19, and then we come to verse 20. This power he exercised in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Now you see that I have broken four points here of verse 21 and verse 22 because I want you to observe this text. He has made them seated at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above every rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come, God put all things under Christ's feet, and he gave him to the church as head over all things. So Jesus being seated in the heavenlies, Jesus being seated at the right hand of God has a great significance for us this morning. Because sometimes we feel so weak. We, we wonder how we can go. We look at this world, uh, it's getting more aggressive. We look at all the problems of this world. We look at all the uncertainties of this world, the, the, the increasing immorality of this world. And then you wonder what's going to happen to us. Here in this text, the emphasis is on the authority given to Christ. Verse uh, 21 says, far above all rule, far above all rule. So it's not only above, but it's far above. So it's the idea of the dignity and the rank. He's in the class of himself. He's far above all rules. And then you have a, a bunch of uh, expression, rule, authority, power, and dominion. And each one in the Greek has a different level of uh, in its definition. Uh, rule is uh, the word rulership the first ones, the ones who are the top of the authority. The authority, the word here, is the ones who have been delegated authority, but they, they have the right to do everything. They have the right to exercise power. And you find that in the example of that in the book of Revelation. The Antichrist and the beast that comes from the sea has received the authority from the first beast. So this, this is the kind of uh, uh, expressions that we find here. The word power is actually quite interesting because uh, Mr. Barclay, who is a theologian, uh, give a definition. It's the word dunamis. says, can be used of any kind of extraordinary power. It can be used of the power of nature, the power of a drug, the power of man's genius, it always has an effective power. So regardless of whatever it is, natural, supernatural, uh, angelic, demonic, or whatever it is, a drug, an addiction, drinking, whatever it is, Jesus has been given the authority far above all of these things. And that is the emphasis of that uh, the, the emphasis of that text this morning no authority or power natural or supernatural including addiction is greater than the exalted so we all can find victory and deliverance and you know get out of our mess and find a better way find a solution find the wisdom and live the life and run the race uh, positively, uh, gloriously, uh, joyfully. Like it, it's not like uh, we're not losing. We're n in reality we're not weak. We are we are not victims. 
we, we are not missing out of something. We have everything. Like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it is true here. And Christ Jesus, he is the expression. He is seated at the right hand of the power. Is all of the things that we have because he is there for us available, interceding, uh, he cares for us, he knows what we need. And, and, and this is what we have in Christ. And now we, see, we read Christ is now the head of the church. Having such power, such authority, that's a good reminder for all of us, for the pastors, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The church members, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Jesus Christ knows his plan for his church. Jesus Christ knows how to rule. Jesus Christ knows the mission that he wants to do. He knows how to make disciples. He knows how to plant churches. He knows how to develop us. He knows how to, and he has desire for us. He's the head. He has desire. He sees. He knows all of us. He knows our mess. He knows when we are in disunity. He knows when we are, you know, in conflicts and having tensions. Uh, he knows what's going on in the church in Corinth that they were quarreling and divisions and dispute and sinful and in immorality. He knows what is in the church of Laodicea. He knows what is in the church of Ephesians. He knows everything. He knows what's happening in Lighthouse. He knows what is happening in our hearts. He is the head of his church with all of his power and authority. And God's incomparable great power is available to all of us. There's nothing too difficult for him. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So there's more. Colossians chapter 3 talks to us about because we know that Christ is seated at the right hand and we, we, there's a part of that text here that talks about our identity and our position. We are with him in that one and I think the call in that text is our mind. It's about our mind. It's about the things we seek. It's about our mindset, our, our worldview, uh, what, what is in our mind. You know, uh, Jesus identifies ourselves in our position with him. Our identification is with Christ's death through baptism and identification with the resurrection. Uh, last week, I went to apply for my new ID because my, uh, my old ID is cracked. I had it for many, many years. Uh, you know, but man, we carry it in our wallet. We always sit on our cards. So we, we break our, our, our cards more often probably than, than women. Uh, but anyway, I had this uh, name card for uh, more than 15 years, I suppose. Uh, and uh, it was broken, so I went to change my old ID. And maybe like me, spiritually speaking, you have an old ID. And your old ID was damaged. My old ID was damaged. So I'm identifying now with Jesus Christ and his death and then his resurrection. Is your old ID damaged? Well, identify with the death of Jesus Christ because your new ID will give you a special standing with God. When I will have my new ID, I will have a new standing with the government of Hong Kong. I have a right of abode here in Hong Kong. I have permanent uh, residence here. That's my ID that I have with this ID. So all of us with Christ Jesus, we have this new ID. Your life is hidden with him. When he will come, you will reign with him. So that's wonderful to do that. I want to finish with uh, another example. Because how do you know? that this is going to happen, that these are not only concept, beautiful concept, but that these, this is the reality of, of, of faith for us, that Jesus Christ is really, really sitting at the right hand of God. You see it in the life of Stephen, the first martyr. Stephen was uh, stoned to death, full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently toward heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That's the only place in the New Testament where he's not sitting. He is standing with God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open 
and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And this is the same word that Jesus says. And in a similar circumstance, the first text we look was at the, the, the tribunal of Jesus Christ when they were accusing him before he went to the cross and they put him to death. Here you have his servant, uh, Stephen, the first martyr for following Jesus Christ. He is in the same similar situation and this extreme cr crisis and the most extreme and fierce persecutions, violent against, against him, accused of blasphemy. The same Sanhedrin that accused Jesus of blasphemy or accusing his servant of blasphemy. They would not tolerate uh, Stephen's words, so they dragged him out and killed him. And Stephen saw the glory of Jesus. And it is very difficult to describe exactly what Stephen saw. Uh, was it a personal vision? Or was it a window of heaven? Like, how did it happen? Like, uh, did he see with his eyes? Was it just a, a dream-like, a vision, or something like this? We don't know. But why was Jesus standing at, for Stephen at that time? It is important for us this morning. He is in solidarity with Stephen. Stephen's ministry in Acts chapter 6 and 7 center upon the martyrdom of, of Stephen. He was a spirit-filled believer, and we need to be just like him. And he was crowned by the Lord Jesus. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of death. And also, Jesus was standing to cheer him up, to give him a standing ovation to Stephen. You are treated just like me. Go on, Stephen. Go on, Stephen. Stephen has been also confessing Christ before men. Christ is now confessing him. He's go going to reveal himself in a special way. Also, Jesus is not, um, uh, how can I say, in a moment of crisis, Jesus is not, we read before that, he is not a high priest that cannot sympathize, that cannot not of Jesus Christ, our high priest. You see that repeated. He does react here with passion, with interest into this moment of crisis. And that might be an encouragement for you also this morning because when you are in your crisis, don't think that Jesus is uninterested or passive or something. You are important to him. He wants you to live in victory. He wants your prayers to be heard and answered. He wants you to be a victorious and joyful Christian, like a, a, a fruit-bearing Christian. Jesus is, is also sad. Jesus uh, receives uh, emotions in, in his life. When you are broken, when you are uh, fallen, when you are messed up in your state, Jesus is not angry shouting, you know, in accusation. We saw that his throne is a throne of mercy. It, it, mercy flows, help flows from him. So Jesus is not against you. He is there to help you. He is sad for you. He, 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 knows, he knows what he can do and you're a liar. He can help you, he can produce what you need to live victoriously in your life. So Jesus is like that this morning with Stephen. The picture of Jesus standing instead of Satan is that he is receiving his child. At the moment when his persecutors were the most violent, the vision of Jesus from sitting to standing was there to encourage and welcome him. It guarded his mind and his heart with the peace of God. We need to have that vision this morning in our heart and to keep it with us. We are going in that direction. Jesus started by saying, you will see it. And the hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting. You will see the effect of that. You will see the honor, the glory. You will see the reign, the eternal sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us Christians in this room this morning, if we persevere to the end, we will see Jesus Christ triumph, sitting in the highest position. I don't know how, wh what it will mean, uh, how our emotions will be at that time, but it will be glorious. It will be... There will be laughter, there will be shout of joy, there will be uh, liberation, there will be, I don't know, how, how we will step and jump and everything, but it will be glorious. I think there's no football game that will have such a cheering crowd as the day when we will come in the presence of Jesus Christ and see the glory on his 
glorious throne and we will see his splendor and his, and his majesty. Someone says, it will always be so. You will never know the completeness of Christ's friendship until you have gone through a storm and his company. When you go on with him, Jesus is going to be with you this morning. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand and uh, uh, try to uh, realize and receive encouragement and comfort of Jesus being on his throne this morning. Interceding, knowing where you are in your life, knowing your problems, knowing your difficulties, knowing the challenge that are set before you, knowing the good and the bad about you, and being there for you, on your side, not against you, on your side, for you, pleading for you, interceding for you, representing you and waiting for you to trust him and receive all the power that his authority has in heaven. Father God, we thank you this morning.